Hi, this is Sadiq from Inside Access, and today I'm here with Anish Vijay Singha, founder of Motion Miracles, Wibble, Cryptic Innovations, and NIMBY. I would say first, I started at a very early age, which was like a, a huge advantage. Um, and I also went into some a field that was somewhat complex, and it required me to sort of manage uh, quite a few things at, at a young age. And also the fact that I was doing multiple things as well at a young age, it, it sort of pushed me in the direction to also manage a couple of companies down the line as well. Um, so the uh, I also read this in a book where if you're a generalist, it helps you be innovative because it allows you to sort of uh, pick off of different things you're working on and then just combine it into one thing. Um, and even at Google they follow that model where generalists are put in charge of product management and innovative driven uh, solutions, right? So that was the attitude I had and I wanted to sort of facilitate that in my mind and sort of put myself in a really uncomfortable situation where I need to deal with a ton of things and then figure it out. Um, and the reason why I could do that was also because I did have the support structure from my previous business, which, um, which allowed me to sort of have that, the financial backing. And then, yeah, and then I sort of put my fingers into all these different big businesses and I figured it out in the sense that I started realizing I could not keep track of tasks and then I could not allocate the time properly. And so I sort of started developing the skills to sort of be able to handle all those things. Um, and yeah, I would sort of have it focus on one thing at one time, then I would focus another, like a sprint into another project and I had that flexibility because I had that support. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would say the trick is to really put yourself in the uncomfortable situation and adapt really fast. It was very stressful, but uh, it, it was worth it at the end because now whatever products that I, I build out, I literally pull from my one project about blockchain and cryptocurrencies, I can pull in models from that into that into one of my education project, then uh, and then from Motion Miracles, the game development, I can gamify it, and then with sensors, I can think about new applications for the education tech field. So it, it's it's a it's an overall benefit, and I know that in the long run, it's going to really pay off because another quote I can mention by Bill Gates, he mentioned. Um, the quote he mentioned was, if you want to do something innovative, I, I probably said something a little different, but if you want to do something innovative, you should have started 10 years ago. So that's sort of the mindset I have and why I'm doing this now. So yes, that is it's a extremely challenging thing, is to split your time amongst different people, different teams. As CEO, it's, it's really important to be with the teams, be with the people in your company, be with your customers as well. Um, and yes, that's a very valid question. And I think that's where maybe some of the compromise does happen, uh, where some of the other projects might get more of my time, while as this, while as another project might not. And that's also, in a way, a good thing because uh, once again at Google, one of the things they say is, if a com if a team relies on you so heavily to the point where you can't disappear for a week. That means uh, that team is unsustainable. That means you have not given the right protocols inside the team. So it also pushes me to make sure I create sustainable teams. And how that happens is through, I guess, by first leading the way. I think, I think part of leading is to really showcase um, the progress you can make by setting yourself as an example. Um, and then also the, 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 the concept of coaching in the sense that you really, you really are able to look deep into that person and be like, you have this problem. Let's figure it out together and really care about the person who's in front of you, the human side of that person, and let that human side be free in the sense that you really need to allow them to speak about their flaws, their weaknesses, without feeling like they're gonna get penalized by uh, a salary cut or whatever. You need to really make them feel like this is a human conversation. Right? We're here to, to help you almost. like. It's, it's really about that and, it's, and and I have to always do a shift in mindset if I was to mention before I get into that mode of trying to really speak to that person's human side uh, as, and I have to shift from CEO to coach, you know, 
because CEO is thinking a little bit more on the business side, not necessarily on the human side. And the analytics, you're looking at numbers, so it's very difficult sometimes. So you, that's one of the biggest challenges to really shift when you're when you're speaking to a person and really trying to identify uh, when you're doing groundwork and trying to see what's wrong with the teams, how you can you know, make it more efficient. Um, and then also time allocation. My, my calendars are like really organized reminders. If I say to someone, I'm expecting this from you tomorrow, reminder next week, I have a reminder and every time like no one can get anything past me. <laughs> so I always check back. Uh, so yeah, that's sort of the secret is also organization. Right, so that is a very, a very challenging question because it also it really depends on the business you're trying to set up. And uh, for example, I would say one of the businesses we've set up, uh, Cryptech, which is about cryptocurrencies and mining cryptocurrencies, that can easily create metrics that an investor can say, we can tell an investor, look, if you just put this amount of money in the project, in two years, it's almost guaranteed that it would make a return on investment. So that's sort of the, and because we can say that at, to an investor, it creates that fear of missing out. I think we have to really emphasize that, that, that word FOMO. If you search it, it's fear of missing out. And if you can create that in an investor, that's the best thing you can do because they're gonna go back home and be like, if I don't invest in this person right now, I'm just gonna regret it, right? So another thing would be, who, uh, Another thing would be, if, who are you as an entrepreneur? Have you, have you scaled your business even without funds? Have you done the groundwork? What is your background in the field? Even if you don't have a background in the field, you need to then think about how you're gonna do that, that background in the field in a sense. Uh, what is the groundwork you're gonna establish as a founder in, in the project? Um, and that is so important for an for, uh, investor to see because that will show how you're gonna progress in terms of speed, efficiency in your project. So for example, uh, within, uh, how do you say, one of the projects that I'm working on right now is we bootstrapped our prototype, we got a small community, and, that, and we did that all in such a short time frame. and we go to investors and we say, look, this is all the progress we've done so far. We have one of the best UX in the field for, for our, our video editing tools and whatever in, in our project. And that would make the investor be like, oh, especially angels, I would say. It, it also depends what type of investor it is. If you are, if you are uh, yeah, we can talk about that later. But yeah, and then the investor would be like, oh, wow, this, this, this guy is like really scaling up fast. If I just put money in it, imagine what he can do. So, I mean, but then I also, at the end of the day, they're looking at numbers. They're gonna look at, have you spoken to your customers? Are your customers willing to pay you early, uh, even without a product, but you just speak to them and they're like, yeah, I'll totally pay for this $10. And they even, there are these strategies you can put in place where uh, on the website, you have your payment gateway and you can set it up in a way that people will, will click, oh yeah, I wanna pay $10 for this, I wanna try it out. And when they click on it and then it fails and it says, sorry, we are, we are at maximum capacity, we can't accommodate you into our systems just yet. And it's actually, you have no product, it's actually like a scam sort of thing where you just get their email and then it's like, now you tell the investor, this is what I've set up. We have 10,000 people waiting for our product to pay $10 a month. So there are these little, there are these little techniques you can do to really validate your product early. That's the most important thing I think for investors to see is how do you validate your product early even without the product. I think uh, once again, going back to the human factor, I think one of the stories I love to talk about is the fact that what actually happened in Silicon Valley, in my opinion, in like pe companies, um, countries, they're all trying to replicate the magic of Silicon Valley, right? And then they build these big facilities, they build like these incubator programs, accelerators and all these things, and then they're like, wait, where are the people? Where are the people? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's funny. And then I think what happened in Silicon Valley was a lot of things went right, a lot of things have to go right. Firstly, the universities were there. But then the companies, you know, companies around the universities, they were promoting a new form of management, which was love-based management. And I think that sort of, you can't really see it, unless you're like, sit is there inside the company in Silicon Valley, you'll be able to be like, 
oh wow, I feel loved here. And in the Silicon Valley, these companies and and even even the even the CEOs, they were like getting this love-based management style on them. And this is basically coaching in the sense that uh, they had. Uh, if I would recommend this book, Trillion Dollar Coach. It's called. It's by. It's a, about a coach called Bill Campbell, who sort of is a football player who coached Steve Jobs, uh, Eric Smith, all the big tycoons in, in Silicon Valley, right? And he basically w was creating this love-based management structure inside Silicon Valley, and that's what made it boom, right? So if you can bring those those values to your company, that's the best thing you can do, especially in Sri Lanka, where it's kind of lacking in terms of. Uh, the bureaucracy that's right now in place. Um, and that's how you make teams function so efficiently. Because as when they know that they're in a supportive environment, they can take flight. 